You are about to meet an exceptional person. Temple Grandin has been called the most successful adult with autism in the world today. And Time Magazine put her on the list of 100 most influential people in the world. Born in 1949, at age two, Temple was diagnosed with autism and brain damage. She did not begin speaking until age four, yet went on to a stellar academic career, culminating in a doctorate in animal science from the University of Illinois. Now a college professor at Colorado State University, Temple is renowned for innovative designs in slaughterhouses, making them more humane. And she has attributed that to her ability to, as she puts it, see it from the cow's eye. She's published 10 books, three on animal science, seven on autism, including the acclaimed books, Thinking in Pictures and The Autistic Brain. Temple Grandin, PhD scientist, college professor, slaughterhouse designer, media star, and a person with a disability. The CTD first contacted Dr. Grandin in 2010 when we featured the biographical documentary of her at our Cinema Touching Disability Film Festival. She was so busy with teaching and her talks on autism and animal science that it took us six months to arrange an interview with her. She was so intrigued by the questions we asked that the interview stretched to 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. She stayed in touch with us after the interview and agreed to a second talk with us while she was visiting the Dallas Museum of Arts this year. During our talk, she shared her expanding views on autism with us. And now, join the Coalition of Texans with Disabilities and our creative partners, Golden Arm Productions, in our second exclusive interview with a remarkable Temple Grandin. Well, if you totally cured autism, you're not going to have any new art for your museum. You're not going to have anybody to run the TV equipment here. Uh, you, you see, I think a brain can either be made more cognitive or thinking or made more emotional. You know, and autism's lots of tiny little, tiny little code variations. There's a point where it gets to be a personality variant. Now, and it's more extreme versions, yes, then you've got a real serious handicap. But uh, you got to think about it. The first stone spear wasn't made by the social yakety yaks around the campfire. That's for sure. It was made by somebody that wasn't that social sitting in the back of a cave figuring out how to make a stone spear and how to tie it to a stick. Well, I think there's a lot of people in engineering, the arts, and writing that have a little bit of the autism spectrum. You see, there's no black and white dividing line between autism and not autism. It's not like having tuberculosis where you either got it or you don't. It's not that kind of thing. There's a point where a little bit of autism where you're not very socially adept is just part of normal personality variation. You see, and then you get a more severe where you've got severe language delay, child may remain nonverbal, he may have epilepsy on top of the autism, then you're getting into something that's a much more severe handicap. The thing that worries me is you have someone like Einstein, when he was three, he had no speech. And he'd be labeled autistic by a lot of school systems today. Steve Jobs would probably be labeled, you know, autistic. You know, what's gonna happen to little Albert and little Stevie today? Well, there's actually a book called Diagnosing Jefferson, you know, Thomas Jefferson, that he had some autistic traits. Uh, there's lots of people running big Silicon Valley companies, and if you look up their interviews on TV, you can tell. I watched a 60 Minutes interview with a guy from uh, Twitter. I mean, make your own uh, decisions on the live ones, but it looks pretty obvious to me. I talked to two NASA space scientists that were retired, and they told me that half their colleagues probably were on the spectrum. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Temple Grandin. Well, here are the happy geeks that got to go to Asperger heaven. You've got the, um, the Mohawk guy, the Elvis guy, and the old hippie. And they put the, um, they put the Mars rover on Mars. What we need to be doing is developing the area of strength and develop that area of strength in the things that can turn into careers. My ability in art was always encouraged and my ability in art became the basis of my um, 
career as a designer, and basically what I've done in the cattle industry is a field called industrial design. When I design a piece of equipment for the cattle industry, I can actually run that piece of equipment in my mind. And I didn't know that other people couldn't do this. I'm seeing too many smart, geeky kids where their whole life is revolving around autism. I get asked all the time when I snap my fingers and make myself not the autistic. I like the logical way I think, but autism is secondary to career things. It bothers me when I go to an autism conference and a nine-year-old walks up to me, a real smart little nine-year-old, and they just want to talk about autism rather than talking about their science project or their art project or whatever thing that they're working on. And I had a mom talk to me one day and she really made me think. And she was a teacher at a community college and she came up to me and she said, I have a son who's in his mid-30s. He's got a great job with a tech company and I'm almost positive my son's on the spectrum. But when my son was young, he was just weird Sammy. And I, we'd yank him up out of bed in the morning, we'd get him to do stuff. And, and she says, I don't know if I would have been as strict with him if he'd just been poor little Asperger. You know, it's, uh, would he have become the label? No, I made him do stuff and now he's got a great job he loves. You've got to stretch him. But you can't just chuck him in the deep end of the pool. I like to use visual analogies. That does not work. because um, both my sons are on the autism spectrum and um, Temple Grandin has been a major hope and an inspiration for us. Helps us understand what's going on and how we can help our kids. In the autistic brain I address the diagnostic mess that's very much addressed in it. Go through the whole history of the DSM, and it's kind of shocking how it keeps changing. You know, nobody's doing that to West Nile, you know, uh, diagnosis. You either got West Nile or you don't have it. The thing about the DSM, it's uh, probably half science and half politics. And, and I'm just too much of a hardcore scientist. Obviously, things like depression are real and OCD and things like that. But when you start, cutting everything up in these all these little tiny subcategories, I really question that. The thing is, social communication problems is a core problem in autism. And to rename Asperger's social communication disorder and then say it's not on the autistic spectrum is absolute bull because um, the social communication issues are the core problem. That's one of the things that goes across uh, most of the um, people on the autism spectrum. Um, I have two kids with um, with Austin, autism slash, you know, Asperger's spectrum sort of. It, it's all crazy now, you know. And um, I just kind of I've heard so much about Temple Grandin, so I was really excited that she was going to be here and just get to see her and talk. And the way my autism works is like, for one thing, if there was a medication that could just clear all effects of autism, I would not take it honestly, because it allows me to see on things on a whole different spectrum, like a completely different level. She loves to rip things. And no speech yet at the age of? Four. She's four. Well, you still have, there's still an awful lot of little kids not getting early intervention. That's terrible. You know, you got a kid that's five years old, and you know, you got to work with these little kids. Absolutely got to work with them. That improves the prognosis, because when I was three years old, I had no speech. You know, and I would just be sitting there rocking. And if someone hadn't worked with me, I wouldn't be here now. That's a big aggravation. I'm really upset about all the drug zombies and really bad use of medications. You know, use medication, try one thing at a time and watch and see exactly what it does. We want to be trying other kinds of educational things first. Some of the diets help. Um, getting enough omega-3s can be helpful. Exercise. Uh, a lot of boys don't get enough exercise. And and I take medication for, you know, stop the panic attacks. I mean, there's a use for careful, conservative use of medication, but it's way too much medication given out to little kids like candy. It is just shockingly bad. I was bullied and bullied and called all kinds of names. And the only place where I was not bullied was the special interests. And for me, it was horseback riding, electronics, and model rocket club. We've got to get kids involved in specialized activities. 
where there's a shared interest with peers. I mean, it could be a school play, band, uh, working for the school newspaper, you know, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, FFA, 4-H, um, there's just all kinds of, of different things like that. Now, one of the things that helped me is I got recognized for my ability in things like drawing and uh, working in science and things like that. And when I showed people my drawings, they go, oh, you drew that? Well, maybe you're not so weird after all. I can remember in high school, I made this really great boomerang out of a piece of plywood and it actually came back. And one of the boys that teased me, actually, I thought that was pretty cool and the teasing stopped for just a little bit. First of all, we gotta find out some things the person is good at. You know, and for me, it was design, and the way I sold my cattle handling jobs is I showed people my portfolio. And then I started writing for the farm magazine, so that was another portfolio I built up, one little article at a time. So when you're a weird geek, I got to sell my work, not myself. I mean, I know a guy who runs a telephone answering service, and he's in a wheelchair. And the only way I found out he was in a wheelchair, I was talking to him one day, and he said he couldn't get across the office because he couldn't roll over a cable. And I'd known him for years, and I would have never have known that. I can remember when I had my, my blind roommate, we'd go to movies together, and I'd, we'd sit in the back, and I'd whisper the visuals to her. And then she got a radio that would uh, play TV channels, so we would, uh, we still called it watching Star Trek together. For me, the most interesting and poignant thing that she said was when someone asked how to get their child involved with, um, you know, different things in the world, and she said, you know, you could take this child to an oil rig. She goes, it's probably illegal, but she said, I have a category called illegal but not wrong, <laughs> and I just thought that was hilarious, and I thought it's just so, it applies to so many different things in, in the world, I think. One of my favorite chapters in the autistic brain is the one about the different kinds of minds. I'm a photorealistic visual thinker who thinks totally in photorealistic pictures. Had a lot of difficulties with the math and algebra. Another kind of mind is the mathematical mind, the pattern thinker. These are the kids that are often really good at math, but they have trouble with reading. And then a third type of specialized mind is the word thinker mind. One of the things I get fascinated with is how the different kinds of minds can work together to do really well on projects. Like take, for example, the iPhone. Steve Jobs was an artist that made the user interface. That's the art kind of mind. And then uh, the engineers have to make the inside of the phone work. That's the two kinds of minds working together. You could diagnose the, the social problems in autism with a brain scan technology that's 15 years old and look at how the uh, fusiform gyrus and face recognition, how that stuff is not normal, don't recognize expressions. That's been around for a long time. But then you're gonna cut autism up into its component parts, which are gonna be, okay, the social communication part of it. Then you get the fixated kind of obsessive compulsive um, repetitive behavior, fixated interests, then there are the sensory uh, problems. Those are very variable from one case to another. One kid's got visual problems, another kid's got touch sensitivity problems. And, and that can be diagnosed separately. Also have some of the brain scans that were done in Walter Snyder's lab with the latest diffuse and tensor imaging that can track all the little cable fibers that act as the inner office communication between different parts of the brain. And this is where I really think you're gonna be able to break it up into its component parts. Because for example, my language output circuit is abnormal and has reduced bandwidth. And that would explain why I had trouble getting speech out. Then you got another kind of kid that's echolalic. Oh, output's working fine. They're yakking out every movie script, but they don't know what the words mean. You see, you could actually diagnose those two kinds of, of language problems, you know, with this brain scanning technology but it's gonna then cut out these umbrella terms like autism and, and cut these things up into smaller component parts based on different brain systems. My thinking is bottom up. This is another thing. People on the autism spectrum don't think top down with a vague concept. Let's take a concept like be nice. I have to learn that concept by specific examples. Politely waiting in line at the movie theater is an example of being nice. Saying please and thank you is being nice. Uh, taking some flowers to somebody is being nice. I have to like put a whole lot of things like that in the be nice category. Concepts consist of examples put in specific categories. Like if I think about a church steeple, you know, that's different than a cell phone tower. And then sometimes you got a church that rents out to the phone company, so then you got both. 
what's happened with the mild people on the spectrum that are my age is they managed to get jobs, and good jobs sometimes. And one of the reasons is they were taught social skills in the 50s, 60s, and even in the 70s. Kids were taught social skills in a much more rigid, structured sort of way, taught to shake hands. I'm seeing too many kids that haven't learned how to walk up to a McDonald's and order their food. They haven't learned how to shop. They haven't learned how to just do a lot of these real basic things. We've got to teach those things. In fact, when I was around uh, 18 or so, uh, we were remodeling the kitchen, and I was kind of scared to go to the lumber yard myself because I didn't want to talk to the clerks. Well, my mother just made me go. And then when I was in my early 20s, I had a boss that told me I was a slob and I had to clean up. And yes, I was upset by that, but you know what, I thanked that boss for that. There's a scene in the movie where he slams down the deodorant and says, you stink, use it. I thank him for that. Use it, Temple, you stink. Thank you. Way before a kid gets to be 21, we need to be teaching the work skills. We need to be figuring out what they're gonna do next. You know, in autism, you've got half the spectrum that's really severe. They're gonna to have to live in a supervised living situation. But then you got the other half of the spectrum that ought to be out working in the workforce. How about uh, working in the farmer's market on the weekend? How about make PowerPoints and sell them? Fix computers at local businesses. You just gotta figure out these things. I'm seeing smart kids that have graduated from college, graduated from you know, a really well-known school of design and art, and then they get out in the workplace and, well, they don't want to do the employer's stupid bird videos. Well, they might need to do those stupid bird videos and put them in a portfolio so then they get a job that's a better job. They haven't learned that discipline of work. And that's what she really stressed, I think, is, is to push outside your comfort zone, to go. And, and it's not just her comfort, it's my comfort zone too, for where I feel she'll be safe and, and want her to blame. She's, she's ready for college. She's more ready than I am <laughs> for her to go, so. I'm going to Texas A&M University at Commerce, majoring in communication arts with emphasis in new media. I hope to either work in toy design, work for some kind of cartoon company or Disney or something like that, or to work for my own magazine. What, me worry? Thank you. Thank you for having me understand my name. No, that's great. Well, you know, one way you can make one is just get under the mattress and put the mattress in the box spring. All my dreams are in full color, um, and they're totally visual. You know, there's sound in my dreams, but that's secondary. And since I have, um, you know, cerebellar you know, balance problem, I sometimes dream about I'm up on a ski slope that's like that and wish I wasn't up there. Well, I don't have any plans to retire. Now, obviously, there's things I can't do. I used to be able to go out in the four foot high cattle loading dock, or you could go out the loading dock here in the back of this museum, it's four foot high, my hands on it and jump up onto it. Well, in my 20s I could do that, I can't do that now. That's just not gonna happen. <laughs>